and we are right. recording. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody, to our uh, week 12 of our, our forecast builder experiment. Um, this is a, a webinar that we're going to go ahead and go over some of the things that have been going on this past couple weeks since our last webinar and um, get you updated on some of the plans we have and um, what we have uh, going on over the next, uh, I'd say, uh, two weeks to, to month, especially as we head to the next uh, tech order we're looking at. So um, go ahead, Andy, and give me the next slide, and we'll get right into this. Uh, first off, in the spirit of the holidays, we do want to sincerely thank all of you participating in this uh, from the, the GMAT team. Um, this is the, includes the management um, and working with us to help us um, get this uh, this experiment going. The union stewards we're working hard with trying to make sure that all the union concerns are met, and especially all the forecasters out there who are day to day working with this project and providing us excellent feedback and um, really uh, have taken it to heart what we're trying to do here and um, been um, honestly giving us some of the best uh, suggestions and, and best uh, ideas we have coming through this project coming straight from the forecasters using. Uh, forecast builder and, and working with the uh, the the the, the, um, the the consistent uh, and common starting point. So we really appreciate that, and and we are very pleased with the the feedback and the uh, response we've been getting from the field on this. Um, as I alluded to, we've been seeing amazing collaboration during this project. The the uh, the back and forth we've been getting from the, the forecasters and the the. the the folks working on it, from management to SUS and everybody involved has been uh, amazing. Um, all the feedback has been very helpful, constructive. Um, we're definitely able to see areas where we need improvement. We, we can see uh, places where some of the ideas that come from the field, some of the ideas that uh, cause us to think about other ways of doing it have uh, certainly already uh, helped to improve the project. And we look forward to uh, doing that more as we uh, head into the new year. So uh, the best thing I, I like about this is that a lot of these ideas are coming in with a, a real strong focus on science, and, and we're seeing the real, um, we're really seeing some great scientific techniques and, and, and the, 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 the technology behind there, that able to get as much as we can, as, as strong a science component out of the uh, model uh, starting points that we can. And um, the flexibility that everybody has shown in order to help us to uh, come up with these these other ideas and. Um, and, and certainly the patients as well to uh, deal with some of the, the shortcomings that we might have uh, uh, inadvertently let into the system as we make some of these changes. I, I do appreciate that as well. And definitely uh, just keep those great ideas and suggestions coming. We're uh, looking forward to a, 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 a fast-paced uh, new year as we uh, move into the next set of tech orders that hopefully meet some of the problems we've been having and some of the uh, opportunities actually are presented as well with, with um, what the model data that makes available for us and some adjustments we might have on that, that uh, avenue as well. So I just again thank you very much for everything that, that you guys are doing to participate with this. Um, uh, just a reminder right off the bat that a lot of our stuff is right there on the VLAB. We've got a very active forum there. If you have any questions, anything you want to have, maybe more of a roundtable discussion with um, not just the folks on the GMAT team uh, and the folks uh, developing the forecast builder, but also with uh, your fellow forecasters. If you guys want to just have a, a, a roundtable discussion on um, maybe better ways to hit a target of opportunity or places where things can be improved, then the VLAB uh, is definitely a place to, to have that, those conversations. Uh, last I checked, I think there were over 50 uh, open discussions on there and um, questions that have been answered. And, and just definitely remember that's a, a great avenue for um, discussing things that might come up during um, um, this, this experiment. And um, often it is a manned uh, um, 24 hours a day if somebody who happens to be on the team is on shift and notices, um, they'll definitely uh, get back to you if they've got an answer. So we're uh, trying to be as responsive as possible and just to keep the, the discussion going, get into the get ide new ideas and, and better ideas into the mix of how we're, we're doing stuff. So I appreciate everybody uh, using that, that uh, structure there to uh, get back to us and to uh, participate in the discussion. So thanks. Okay, Andy, uh, back to the next slide. On the previous slide, I guess we'll go right down the top. There we go. Hmm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thanks, Chuck. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so you're jumping into this uh, this recent storm, I wanted to bring some positive news. Uh, I like to do this at, on every web on every webinar uh, coming out of the project. Um, this was our snowfall forecast grabbed from the big on uh, you know running. 48 hour one there from 12D on the 16th, 12D on the 18th. You know, I'm just pretty much amazed at how, you know, how consistent this graphic is. 
um, from the mountains all the way eastward across the region. Uh, it's just it's just really cool to see that. Uh, I mean, and there's then there's detail, of course, in there as well. Uh, and if and if you look too, I mean, you know, one one side of this was the consistency, but you look at the you know accuracy, pretty much nailed the axis spot on. Now the amounts were maybe a little overdone. We've been kind of tracing that at least back in our own forecast area here in Lacrosse about what the what the causes were and. Some of it was QPF, some of it was QPF driven, a little bit the snow ratio, but it seems to be maybe more more QPF than anything. But again, the axis hit spot on. You knew that there was going to be some heavier amounts, so you know that's I think really 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 cool to see both on both sides of that both consistency and the accuracy. Also talking consistency, this was an image of storm total snow, which is in this in this case um, an ISD graphic um, when we sum up all the ISD grids uh, around us. And again, this is a 36 hour forecast, but I mean, this is just am amazing to see. Uh, it's consistent down to the, basically down to the tent uh, between all, all of our neighboring offices. Um, I don't think we've ever seen something that, that consistent. Again, the amount's a little high, but that's still, you know, I think pretty good. <laughs> Ice accumulation. Uh, obviously, this, this event had some ice to it. Uh, in fact, when we go through this event, you will see, and I'll show you in some slides here, about this was a great case where the prob ice present grid, uh, one, of the, one of the top down grids, is, is required. Um, there were numerous reports uh, of icing and observations, um, and of course, just from various other observers, uh, and, and you had so, you know, a lot, a lot of accidents. Uh, I just have listed some of them there. I mean, there were a lot more. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the final tally was, but there probably was on the order of 800 plus in center region uh, alone. You know, shutting down I-29 for a time in northwest of in northwest Missouri. Uh, I did take this one, you know, snip, snip it out that you know, out of the Springfield, Illinois news that from traffic that they couldn't be interviewed because there were so many patients coming in. Just really an impact here of the, the freezing drizzle uh, that was uh, that was occurring. And again we had it, you know, we had it in the forecast because this was this was generated Friday Friday morning and these this news report was in the afternoon. So uh, people are aware that there was going to be a freezing drizzle concern. In fact uh, I grabbed this snatch, snapshot from Saturday morning at, at eleven Z just kind of depicting, you know, going back to the kind of the accuracy part, uh, there's your freezing, you know, there's your freezing drizzle highlighted in red, um, both in kind of like the, the surface of, I mean, there's some of it's just the fog mist, but that's probably some freezing drizzle mixed in. And in fact, you look at it, Kansas City's radar there, or Pleasant Hills, that you see the, you see the signal just in regular base reflectivity um, occurring. So, um, Don, during the uh, late morning on Friday uh, in, in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and that, that area, I thought I'd grab a quick quick sound and just to reflect that uh, prob ice present need. If you look at you know, it just doing a top-down approach there with the sound, and you go from snow production up there in that 15 to 20,000 feet, you come down through this dry layer that basically would absorb all that snow deep enough and dry enough, so that that dry layer, likely the dry spot of this uh, of the system, just cancels that off from a loft. Continuing on down, you get into this zone of where you're on minus 10, and, and minus 10 basically would be the switch to start having some ice in the cloud, but it may not be fully. And if you look at the webcam image, image in the upper right from Parkersburg, which is not not too far away, uh, you see that ice accumulation uh, happening on the on the webcam. And then there's the report too from Marshalltown, which also isn't too far away from Cedar Rapids, having some uh, light freezing, light freezing rain drizzle happening. And here's the actual prob ice present grid. This is just snapshotted from our uh, from our office, but you see, you know, that 50% um, suggesting, hey, you could be dealing with some mix of both freezing drizzle and snow. Uh, and I think that's what we basically saw. During that, in fact, the value started to drop. I think as it got towards the evening hours, 
even fa more favor in freezing drizzle. So you take a look at the uh, another graphic just of ice cream. You know, looking at this on a six-hour time scale, this was actually created from on the on the 15th. So this has been a, a couple days out and just so smooth on, on consistency. And I think this was another area. You know, Indianapolis had the had that ice and happen. So just I think again, really cool on the consistency side. And one more note on consistency was grab, I grabbed this out of the NDFD, out of central region, just high, highlighting our region alone there. Our, for every element on there, our consistency is the highest. Um, and, and that includes snow amount, and we're all above 95%. The, the little drop in snow amount, trying to figure out where it's going to work with the Great Lakes community, some of, some of that's might be a result of zeroing out of snow over the lakes. I am not 100% sure, but I, I think that might be a potential cause. Uh, and just for comparison, if you remember from the initial tra training back in, in that webinar in July, the snowmobile consistency for that whole 10-year span on average was 86%. So we improved it by almost 10%. Um, I mean, I know we're just talking 30 days, but something at least Something good's going on here, that at least on the consistency side, which is, of course is very important to the the national uh, the national partners and, and headquarters up the line. Um, not to just completely dwell on consistency again, going back to accuracy. This was taken out of a present on a presentation uh, Jeff Craven uh, created, uh, just looking at QPF from Central Region from Central Region from the official Super Blend and WPC. Uh, I'm just grabbing a couple snip you know, shots out of there, looking at equitable threat score of quarter inch, and and both. I mean, as you would expect, official and super blend are pretty much on on par. So that you know, and what you see there is you know good good values, and then the bias, both the you know we have at least a lower a lower bias to our QPS, looking at just a at a quarter inch quarter inch uh, at all time at all time scales, going up to one inch. Uh, more significant kind of QPF measure. Not that we've had a lot of one-inch events between October 4th and November 29th, but a few. And uh, you know, here too, you know, top here for most part on all all the equitable threat scores for this on the official. The bias we're pretty you know, you know we're pretty much on par there with this with the super blend, but much less than what's coming out of WPC. And again, we don't have any WPC as you know in the QPF. Um, QPF uh, forecast. Now we're just using just the con just the consensus data and a, and a little bit of previous. So I think that's pretty good to see. Jump it into some science news here on pops. I'm going to let uh, Jerry uh, Jerry talk on this subject. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get myself unmuted. So yep, no problem. um, are you there? Yep, we hear you. So basically, we've been, you know, getting lots of feedback saying that we have a bias issue, um, that we have a pretty low bias um, with the super blend pops, and people are very concerned about it. Um, we've heard about it from the uh, Plains WFOs. We've heard about it from um, the Great Lakes WFOs. So we're trying to investigate what to do, what we can do as a stopgap. I think the the overall answer is that we're going to go towards the national blend. But right now, we can't use the National Blend because uh, we only have 12-hour pops coming out of the National Blend, and we need six-hour pops. So that's going to be the final solution, but what, right now, we're working towards more of a stopgap solution. So just um, to recall, the Super Blend weight is about 80% raw model and MOS output and 20% previous. So there, that previous in there, you know, if you have an uncollaborated grid, that might be why um, your previous, your super blend could be a little bit different. Um, but the, another important part here is a lot of sites that were missing MOS guidance, and there was some notes sent around by Matt Foster, and we can, you know, certainly help you if you find you're missing that. Um, but if you're missing MOS guidance, that'd be another reason why you guys might be a little bit different. Um, and because that was another little problem that came around, um, but I think that one's people are getting that solved. Um, so this the the smart init curve is more along the lines of what Andy actually dealt with a while ago. Um, so basic, 
basically right now we have pumps that are highly dependent upon how much precip is in the model. So if you have a lot of precip, you're going to have a lot of you're going to have high pops. Um, it'll be hard to ever get the hundreds, but it can happen. Um, you can see it, and it, as you can see here, 0.5 equals about 97%. Um, so the idea is, what can we do to fix this, especially during the winter time? And one thought process that we have going on right now is um, there's been a lot of research on using neighborhood pops, and basically what that involves and entails is looking at a single grid point and looking at the neighbors around that grid point and then basically summing up the neighbors that have precip and dividing by the total amount of neighbors that have precip. Um, this is something that it's very in the very early stages that we're looking at. Um, it's usually more for convective allowing models and thought of to be used during um, the winter time season. But we're thinking that maybe if you limit the precip to like 0.03 inches and look around, it may ha help, especially in the extended time frame. Um, and then especially if you're sort of merging that in with the moss pops, um, they tend to be a little bit low. So if you have high pops from that neighborhood pop um, and then, you know, a little bit lower pops from the moss type fields, we're hoping that it may average into something that's a little bit higher and something that um, people would like to see more in like the day four time frame. So um, that's basically where we're going. Um, and I've asked for some sites to test this out. And hopefully we can get something out. If this doesn't work, we have a couple other ideas. Um, but this is where we're at right now. And hopefully we can get something out to you guys to fix the problem before the end of the winter. We're hoping probably mid-January some time frame. So, Anyhow, um, I will pass this back on over to Andy. Hey, thanks, Jerry. Um, I, I would like to stop right now just really quick to see if anybody has any questions uh, on this, and I can uh, just raise, raise, your, uh, raise your hand there in your GoToWebinar go app, app there, and I'll unmute you. Ben, I've unmuted you. It's not actually Ben. He's oh. not here today, but the rest of us here at Grand Junction are listening. All right. Um, <laughs> Julie, hey, just a quick question, um, not with Forecast Builder, but just real quick with the uh, with the observed snowfall graph that you showed uh, from the big. What what sources is that taking into account? I was wondering if you guys knew that. Oh, okay, that that's that's mostly the the no risk snow analysis. All right, that's all I have. <laughs> Otherwise, everything else is good. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, looks like nobody else has any more questions, so I'll continue on with the webinar. All right. Next is uh, next is the diurnal tool, our diurnal procedure that, based on what I've seen, various feedback coming through, even from our occurrences that we've experienced here at La Crosse. Um, there seems to be a cash issue occurring in mainly days four to seven, which just so happens to be the time when super blind is fixed hourly. And the cause of what you might see like an image on the right is related to this use hourly min max config setting that's in diurnal config. Here in Central Region as part of um, various tech orders here, uh, we've, we've got this set to true. Uh, and basically because we want to ensure that the hourly temperature will get up to your max or min. Uh, now we can get rid of the issue by setting the that config setting to false. But in that situation, then your hourly T will never reach your high or low. In fact, I've noticed that you might be a couple degrees off your high or low temperature. So. Needless to say, the grid team is looking into this issue um, further, and we're even doing some trying to do some verification of diurnal versus using the just straight out hourly temperatures from Superblend to see if there's any any difference there, which one might be which one might be better. So, all right. 
On to some science news. The first one right after bat, which is something I noticed working on Sunday, is that the high-res ARW is not ingesting snow cover. Um, so I noticed it was not doing very well in the Arctic air mat. Temperatures were rising way too fast. Um, we just got a response back to, from EMC today here. They are alert. Obviously, we, we alerted them, and they are aware of the problem. Um, they are going to try and get a fix in ASAP, um, but I don't have a date. Uh, during the most recent tech order, uh, we applied a weighted pop QPF approach, uh, which helps, especially during mixed precip uh, scenarios, to help divide the QPF a little better between the type. Let's see here a little, and back in, prior to that tech order, we had a problem where we'd have this pot leak grid um, and commodity in the ring with, and, and, and the ring, you'd have this thin stripe that's been resolved. Uh, now I've added this more p-type uncertainty when you've got a sound in that sitting just above freezing at the surface and your max wet bulbs are between zero and one. Uh, just assign 100 to the three types. And so, you, you know, that, that range, you know, you're gonna, you could be bouncing um, between types. Uh, you know, it might, it's just a very sensitive range. So that's been, that's been a change within that, within that tech order. Next news is prob ice. I uh, mentioned about this on the previous webinar at Lacrosse. Here, where we're redefining the grid to help target just deep saturated layers. So, um, you know, where just ice and the clouds are not present, and basically, this helps forecaster builders' ab ability to discriminate between freezing rain, drizzle, and snow. Uh, in fact, uh, we're even at Lacrosse, we put it on the cron, and we're evaluating whether or not it's good enough to send out to, put to the test beds or beyond that. And I thought I would just show you an example of what that prob ice present grid looks like. Um, on the left is the actual grid. Um, this is taken from the GFS, uh, and this was today for 15Z. And on the southwest side there uh, of, the, of the graphic, and I've got a cross section on the right, to kind of correlate around that. So your cross section is running southwest to northeast. On the left, you get in an environment that's too dry. In the previous prob ice present, it would give, it would give you zero. Um, now it's going to give you 100 because it says, hey, this is not a drizzle environment. Then you get into that, that middle section there of the prob ice present grid, which is zero. That's your environment that's favorable for drizzle and freezing drizzle. On the cross section, you can see that the uh, you got Deep, you know, deep moisture there, actually going all the way up to 8, 850, and the temperatures that are sitting between minus minus six and minus nine. You're not getting anywhere to minus, at least to minus eight, minus or even minus eight, minus nine, minus ten. To start introduce nice until you get all the way to the northeast, where you get in a much more favorable situation for snow, um, where you know you're deeply saturated, even well through that spot where you can get ice nucleation. So some uh, research projects underway. Uh, mentioned this also in previous webinar was using surface wet bulb to help determine p-type. Um, and again, this is just for warmest air near the surface. That is that one section of the uh, step four in the tree and the precip types in that where you have that GUI to input surface temperature. Um, we're looking at surface wet bulb and just based on some preliminary statistics uh, that it looks like less than 33 for all snow and then a small range there for rain, snow mix, and then to, to rain at 34 and a half. But again, still further work to do there. And then we're also um, considering that, I mean, this will be a longer, maybe a longer term project, but replacing prob refreeze fleet with min temperature loft uh, just, and could help a little bit with uh, determining P type situations. Now for some tech, some tech news. Uh, Coming up in January is going to be a big, a big upgrade. A lot of things going on with it. First, and this is what uh, Milwaukee and us and uh, a few other offices have been testing outside of Central Region, um, is the Canadian model. The Northern Hemisphere will go out to 240. Um, you'll have three hourly to 84 and six thereafter at 25 kilometer horizontal resolution. It used to be 60, and many more vertical levels. And there, therefore. We're going to be able to also, both the Canadian NH and the Canadian Regional will get added to the top-down blends. We have enough uh, vertical bubble data to do that, which would be nice to help balance out the, the GFS and NAM situation uh, scenarios. 
and get a little better of a blend. Uh, also, the SPC SRF calibrated thunderstorm severe probabilities will get added. Uh, we'll get um, the ability to initialize prop thunder, uh, and that's already that's already in here, being in, you know tested mode. We've got uh, digital aviation services stuff included in forecast builder. We're about 80% complete or so there because we don't have the diurnal queue option that was recently added to aviation populate. Um, MKX and I are working on on that. There'll be some fram adjustments occurring. Um, you know, we had that issue where you would get 100% uh, or basically the same amount of rain as you would freezing rain when you had a situation of wet bulb less than 32 and um, and that temperature between 32 and 35 that we're now going to apply a curve and reduce the probabilities. Um, that's after our coordination with the FRAM authors. We get some OBS grids added for snow and ice, which we, you know, as mentioned there, bringing the MRMS QPE and the, and the top-down approach to give you some, some semblance of an OBS grid for uh, an hourly and a six-hourly uh, OBS grid uh, related. Related, um, we're looking also at snow amount verification using that OBS grid. Uh, might, again, this might be option. This will be an optional item at least we're looking at right now for the install the tech order. Highline ice acume, foliot and dry thunderstorms. The aforementioned update to prob ice uh, will co will go out. And I'm also and today I've started working on this to do some performance improvements on weather. Uh, uh, Right now, if, if I can get this out, or I'm going to try in January, I've decreased by like two orders of magnitude um, the time it takes to generate weather. <laughs> so it'll be amazingly fast. Some, out, some outstanding science issues we've got uh, from the previous webinar about the sh simplification of shower stratiform drizzle rain and the top down for days four through seven. Uh, you know that's still under discussion amongst the amongst the grid team right now. I just kind of had that idea that a if you see a, a situation where you might have a you know, high impact ice storm at looking out in days four through seven, then start throwing in the the top down grids. Um, but I thought it would allude a little bit more into that with the situation that we've got kind of going on right now with this uh, <laughs> Christmas storm uh, that's that's coming into central region for the again for Christmas. So. On the left, I grabbed an image from the uh, from the zero Z GFS on the 19th. And again, for most of you, you the, your top-down blend, you only have the GFS available, so I figure we'll just use the GFS for this case. Uh, and again, it's, so it's 168-hour forecast. And you, you know, it, that's a decent decent setup for probably a mixed precip event over the at least over the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes. However, 24 hours later, then uh, the next GFS run, uh, zero Z run, comes in, and it's completely different, farther west. So the science, the science is the science is good that you know underneath those specific model conditions, you would have you know this mixed P type storm impacting the upper Midwest, and at that hour. But now that's completely, you know, shifted west. I mean, there still might be mixed precip on the onset, but I mean, it's not nearly the same magnitude as what it looked like, you know, from previous runs. So it's just one of those caution notes about, I think, about the top down in that, in that days four through seven. It's a predictability issue is what it is. So um, I did want to open it up a little bit here on that top down. Any further discussion on that uh, or questions? We talked a lot about, about prob ice and anything science related there. Anything we can help you with? Just raise your hand if you have questions or comments. I believe uh, Jim Siva King has a question. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, it's more of a comment. Um, I I agree that we need to kind of lock down when we're going to do the top down methodology. Um, it's not just in the extended, it's also in the near term. If only one office or a couple offices are doing the top-down methodology in the near term, then collaboration of those weather grids becomes a nightmare, and uh, I continue to hear that from my forecasters. Yeah, that's, a good, that's, great, that's a great point, Jim. Yeah, by, by uh, the cron will populate those top-down grids for your period, period three through, um, through day three. 
um, but they're not going to do anything about them, about them in period 0, 1, or 2. So you want to make sure that you may have to go in and, and adjust them based on the situation like the December 16th, 17th event. That event, you, for, for quite a few offices, all you had to do, do was prob ice. Um, some offices, like, like yours, Jim, where you had the max wet bulb may have been impacting types. Uh, that would have been also needed to look at. <clears throat> All right, uh, hey, Alexander, Jimmy. I saw your hand up. Uh, Alexander, are you on, uh, can you hear us, or can we hear you? No. Um, you might you might have to put your pen in or something, yeah, because we can't hear you yet. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead. Okay. Uh, oh, there, there we go. Hey, can you. you hear me now? Yep. No. Uh, we hear you. You can hear me. Yep. All right. Sorry, guys. This is we're, we're in Davenport, and we were we one of the things we're thinking about is when you use Forecast Builder in the short term. Like um, today, we sat down with it, trying to figure out what percentages of prob ice, ta and then the prob refreeze sleet and max stibial off would give us certain values of like chance. It allowed us to you know come up with chance of freezing rain. And chance of snow or one of those things. Is there a way you guys could give us, um, like, you know, just a schematic of, okay, this is what's going. For instances where we've got stuff going on right now, give us like a flow chart of, at these certain values, this is what you would end up with as your weather, uh, your weather term, or your your. We're gonna have. Yep. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's uh, I, I understand understand your question, and and pro and probably a different way. I'm gonna I'm gonna propose a little different way to 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 think about it. Again, this is just one of those kind of change view ideas here. Um, is to just kind of look at these grid, look at these grids, max wet bulb, prob ice, and prob refreeze. Just 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 look at the environment and forecast. And like, yeah, if you have a dry like if you see a dry slot coming at you on IR Sally, whatever. Your prob ice should scour out to zero. Um, I'm bearing something going on way low with a really, really deep cold layer, which we actually saw in that 16, 17 event. But anyway, uh, that's just the that's just the idea. Same with max wet bulb is to warm it, warm it or cool it based on you know warm vection, cold vection. You have the, certainly the guidance there, and then you could just let the types let the types all drop out, um, and and so I I, I think. It's sort of like, yeah, you're, and I think that's what we've had in the training is that you're forecasting the environment, and whatever your environment comes out with, um, whatever you put in the environment stuff is what will will determine your types. I know that might be a little different from, again, what the way you're normally thinking. I would say just just give it a try, see how see how it en ends up. Um, that help. Well, as Andy, sometimes. Sometimes it's challenging in the in the real short term when, uh, in particular, with the prob ice uh, present, and you've got uh, a certain set of weather. For example, Saturday was freezing drizzle across our south, and then a pretty good uh, cutoff between uh, that and and light snow and heavier snow central and north. But I think just a a rough idea of some of the different thresholds would help you manipulate those grids a, a little bit uh, easier yeah. in in some of those cases, especially in the term when you're struggling to to create some some grids that actually match the reality of what's going on. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that does. Yeah, so I think like, like that like that situation that you ran into on Saturday was a complete that was a complete prob ice present grid grid that that was pretty much the only one that really needed focus on. 
as those values drop to zero, you go to the you go to your freeze and rain, freeze and drizzle uh, setup, um, and um, I don't, let me back up because I have a you know like th like this uh, like this example because that was here. That's kind of your event where you had basically 100 values for prob ice up in the north where you were getting snow, and then down to your down yeah down to your south where you're dealing with that more of freeze and drizzle. That would just be a you know drop those to zero. If you if you purely want just you know drizzle rain drizzle rain you know whether it's freezing or not who cares just if you want that kind of type a prob ice down to zero that will do it for you. <laughs> And then if you just want snow, get it up to 100. That's kind of the nice way to treat prob ice, pre prob ice present. 100 is snow and zero is your liquids. Yeah, um, and I, I, should also, I should also mention that uh, um, I see here Dan Baumgart shared a uh, shared a nice one pager um, talking about all these top down top down grids uh, with all the SUs. so um, that might be pretty good for printing off for your staff. <laughs> all right, any other questions? I hope that I hope that helped Alexander. Certainly, if you want, I can e we can email more offline too. <laughs> All right, Let me jump back ahead. All right, so some outstanding technical issues here. Um, when I get, I really want, want to try and work on and get this done for the January. We'll see if it can happen is the GFP time periods and forecast builder matching those of GFP and NDFD. There is some variance there um, about the various requirements and how that for each one and so I'm going to try and iron those out. Uh, obviously we're past the puff, uh, off the frost season but we want to get at some point get the wind wind in there. Uh, weather and in, weather intensity definitions for DS and I put a development and idea in there I, and this might be a little bit more longer term, but in eastern region that they they put a they put one hour snow into their snow mount grid, and then they use the snow mount six hour grid to collaborate, um, and so that might be an, an opportunity because then the one hour snow can be used for both weather intensity and a visibility integrity check, which would be really cool uh, to do. And then uh, you know snow level has been a topic. It's mostly Mostly for Western region, but we've got some of our mountain offices uh, looking at that um, as well. So, uh, and that's another project for that we're kind of still working on. Um, again, briefly about the target to opportunity, uh, we've got some, something formal coming in January here for for guidance on this. Uh, I just still want to keep this up in the forefront. It's always been a a hot feedback uh, kind of hot feedback item. Again, you just solely want to kind of focus on those events that are going to make an impact on your message. Uh, like take the Christmas system for example. Uh, and if if you can try to start collaboration prior to the cron, and that's going to that's something that's going to come out of the uh, come out of that doc, document in January. That try and get that collaboration going early. Um, not not wait for those grids to come in. The venue can be sometimes time crunched, uh, so you know, get that started early. Uh, it'll make that adjustment to crown output go faster. Something like for that Christmas storm, you co coordinate. Hey, we're all going to do the top down grids for it. Something like that. So some future development plans. There, um, we've got a project going on called Haz Hazard Builder. That's uh, solely very, very much an experimental uh, phase. Uh, Looking into that, uh, somewhat similar to EHWO, uh, but I won't dwell more into that. There will be more information coming down about that down the line. Uh, then uh, also a big project about redesign forecast builder to get a back button in. Uh, but again, that's a big project uh, that's going to take some time. All right, uh, I think uh, Chuck, uh, do you want to? 
you want to end end this? I think with the slides we got left. Yeah, I'll take over, uh, Andy. Thanks. Oh. All right, you hear me okay, Andy? Yep. yep. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I just want to. Okay. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for all the feedback we've received so far. We've got about 620 uh, feedback uh, responses in the surveys and submitted it. And uh, we, we, as a team, we look through these and we're trying to track where there's some persistent issues and maybe some we've cleared up and uh, any new ones that might be popping up. So um, definitely uh, fill out those feedback forms. Um, you're welcome to put whatever you want in there. There's a, a section for comments. There's just random comments, any suggestions. We're highlighting all the suggestions. We're highlighting areas where people are dissatisfied so we can try to target those, those problems so we can come up with ways to, uh, to address them. And uh, one of the big issues we've seen right now is Lake Effect Pops and how they are, are not uh, specific enough. The resolution's not good enough for the, in the blended model. So um, Jerry, myself, and Andy actually sat on a Great Lake Sioux call uh, last week and discuss this. So we had a pretty detailed discussion on that. So we're definitely looking at some options that we can do to uh, try to improve that for uh, for those locations. And and a lot of these regional uh, fixes that we, we uh, try to test out and put into the system will also benefit the entire uh, region as well once uh, once we uh, prove it to be um, a solid addition to the, uh, the process. So um, look, look for those opportunities. If, if you um, or your Sioux group uh, have some issues they'd like to discuss that might be a little more specific to your part of the of central region, um, just let us know. We're, we're always available to sit in on calls and just uh, have uh, discussions uh, directly with um, a, a group of offices or, or even one individual office if you think you, you want to have a, a sit down with us as well. So um, just reach out to us and, and we can probably schedule something over the next uh, few weeks and, and, and get that get together with you all. Um, other issues we are um, tracking, obviously there's some stop down, uh, top down issues and suggestions that we've been receiving, so we go through those and you can see some of the evidence of that as uh, Andy was talking about, maybe going to uh, uh, surface TW to try to help distinguish between um, um, rain and snow in some events. So a lot of these ideas are filtering into our, uh, our idea matrix as well. And uh, Andy does have a nice development page where he's tracking the developments for the, uh, the forecast builder. So future developments is on there. And um, a lot of people do have access for that. So as we get good ideas and as a team, we discuss trying to incorporate that. That goes right onto Andy's development tracker. And um, we just progressively work through that to try to get that implemented. And a lot of, some of those things you'll see uh, come to fruition in the uh, January tech order as well. Um, again, one of the issues we're seeing a lot uh, bubble up on the feedback form is collaboration, just the issues with collaboration. This is a long-standing problem in the, in the weather service in general. It's just a uh, difficult thing to try to collaborate a lot of times and, and get everybody on board with the same solution. There's a there tends to be reluctancy in some people not to uh, want to change things, and others are, are gung ho. So. Um, um, as Andy alluded to earlier, we have some guidance coming out from the consistency team that well, should help uh, standardize this a little more and, and provide um, uh, at least a standard reference point of when we should be collaborating and um, um, what we should be collaborating about. And um, I do believe that we're still on track to at least have some uh, assistance from the rocket at some point. So um, hopefully the plans will be in place, uh, maybe not by this by uh, the end of this winter, but maybe by the, it's certainly about to start next winter, we have the uh, the rock could be involved as well if, if there comes some sticking points in collaboration. Um, winds are another thing we're checking. Um, we have reports of being too high during regular weather, and particularly in the afternoon, but also too low for bigger events. So we're we're targeting those, and uh, again, obviously a lot of those situations are are targets of opportunity as well. But we want to maximize what we can get out, the good information we can get out of the model. So we're looking into that, looking for possible smart improvements and, and things that could actually uh, improve the, the the starting point to begin with. So the targets of opportunity become less because the models do better. So. Uh, Darnell T is one of the things that I think Andy showed a little bit about as well is that, that we're trying to fix that, um, the, the complaints we've received about that. We're trying to come up with ways to make sure we're all on the same page and develop and doing it the same way and have their, our configuration set up the same way to improve um, how that, that um, the result of, of running that Darnell T tool. Likewise, at, as we get into an era of having uh, three hourly um, uh, temperature grids all the way out through seven days, it might make sense to just go with a more of a, uh, a more uh, blended model or a direct model uh, um, curve for that out in the in the extended at least. So we're looking into that as well, and we're seeing some good results out of the uh, NBM reads that we've got in there. So we're going to be investigating that and tracking that. We actually have a, a method set up to to track how that does in comparison to the, the typical dynamic T. So um, um, that turns out to have a better option, a better solution for that, particularly in situations where we're non-diurnal as well. Um, I think we'd be looking to try to switch toward that as well. 
Um, if you get error messages, because uh, certainly some of the things we see in there are people mention the error messages that they get with their uh, running forecast builder. Definitely make sure you have the latest version of the forecast builder uploaded and loaded and installed. So if you do get errors, maybe that might be the first thing to check is make sure your uh, GFE Focal Point ITO have the latest version in there. Because some of these things um, were, were errors that were introduced, were quickly discovered and, and updated, but it might not have got all the way out to all the offices that, that needs to be updated with the newest version of, of, of Forecast Builder. And I've got a little link there of how you would do that. You just go to the, late, the, the GF, CR, GFE, Tools, Tags, Latest, Stable, and do the Forecast Builder install. And another thing we uh, see periodically is that people um, um, mentioning that the old uh, POT, the probably of, of type grids and the non precip grids are left over from a previous shift or maybe even uh, two shifts ago and that they didn't realize that they were in there because they don't automatically uh, disappear, they don't automatically get wiped out. Even if you run them again from scratch, some old ones would I'd still be there. Um, so it's good to review those and take those out if you don't want them. I think we are putting in an option though, I'm not sure if they'll be in for the January order or later, but that would allow you to wipe those out um, right at the start of it if you don't want to have those uh, potentially in there. They do serve a purpose though, you can actually get a sense for what the previous ship was thinking um, by looking at what was in there as well before you wipe them out or before you add your, yours in with the, the latest data too. So um, there's a, a some uh, drawbacks and some uh, um, positives for having those in there as well. But definitely uh, keep all the feedback coming and um, we review these uh, as they come in and, and we stay on the top of it. And, that's a pretty quick way to get our attention is to uh, provide that feedback in the feedback form. Um, but likewise, there's other ways to give us feedback too. Um, I just want to make sure everybody knows that we have that uh, the, the VLAB there. We showed that earlier. That definitely has a nice form there. In addition to the form though, there's an FAQ page that um, I, I'm going to take it upon myself to make sure that we get some more FAQ um, uh, additions onto that sheet there. So some of the questions that we've already answered, make sure that those are as part of that sheet so you don't have to cruise through the forum to find the actual answer. We can have a little more prominent there on the FAQ page. Uh, there's also links to training on there and any updates, any news that we have going on there and, and uh, case studies. We get a nice case study up there. If somebody wants to produce a case study and share that with us, we can definitely uh, put that up on the, uh, the VLAB as well to, to share with the group. And uh, Successes are awesome, but even failures, any time where maybe the, the process did not work, if you got a case study showing that, we can put that up there and we have a nice discussion about that as well. So the VLAB offers a great place for us to really uh, just gather our thoughts and um, discuss this uh, as a more of a, a larger process, a larger picture of what's going on as well. Uh, Remind of the full documentation, documentation is up there as well, and then the, the feedback form links. And um, Definitely, uh, some of these things um, also related to the IRMA. So um, we are holding the, the, the IRMA folks and the uh, analysis of record folks' as feet to the fire to make sure that um, as we see the OBS coming in, if we got quality OBS, we want to make sure those get into the the actual uh, analysis of record and make sure that's part of the uh, of the the, the, uh, the information that does and does feed back into our system to make uh, quality uh, bias corrected grades that lead into the super blend comp, cons, cons all stuff and also to uh, the future with the the NBN. Make sure that information goes up to date as possible. So uh, I see a lot of uh, our offices in the central region really uh, getting with those guys and pointing out areas where they need to be adjusted and looked at and making sure that they're on top of what our, our OBS are showing and, and try to get as close to what we believe reality is uh, based on the observation. So I definitely keep that up and uh, um, yeah, keep providing that feedback to them. Okay, is that the last slide, Andy? I, I forget. <laughs> yep, that's it. So. Okay, yeah. well, well, thanks everybody for for uh, for for putting up with us. And any questions at all, we're ready for a just open discussion. But I don't know if Andy or Jerry you want to add anything before we just open the floor up completely. Um, let me check. I had a thought from the I had a thought from the previous. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to mention that the prop the precipitated and probability of type grids, you know, rain, snow, sleet. Uh, those those will um, those will automatically de delete uh, and recreate every time after the when you do step four of forecast builder. I also want to tell people don't forget that step four has a, a an integrity check in there. It's basically a finalized procedure within it. So it, you know re really a lot of your a lot of the offices finalized procedures will basically just duplicate what's running in forecast builder so it might be just extra work to rerun the finalized but i just wanted to mention mention that to you i mean your local office finalized might have
something additional into it, but for the most part, every, all the necessary ones that are needed for NDFD purposes, point and click, are built into Forecast Builder. Step four. That's all I got. Jerry, you got anything? Nope, just bring down the questions. Yep. Okay, one more thing I want to say, I just, uh, Andy remind me of it as he's going through that, is that I think our, part of our goal, and part of this might be built into what with, with the hazard builders that, that will be coming, will be to have some uh, highlighting uh, options, so grids that will be highlighted uh, in the future that would uh, determine um, freezing rain or ice or sleep. So, might, so you might not, you won't be surprised. As you go through the process, it will actually allow those grids to be highlighted, and you can quickly glance through and say, wait a minute, I didn't quite expect that to, have, to come out of that. So um, maybe just catch some of those things a little earlier or let you know you're on the right path. I, I've, I've taken out my prob ice down to zero, so I want to have some freezing rain, and that's what it's showing. That, that's what is indicated now by the highlighting uh, process. So I believe we're going to build that in, too. So that's just another uh, uh, positive feedback to the forecasters as they leave the process, make sure they're on the right track. And that might help answer also what uh, Alexander Gibbs was talking about, too, with, uh, with just making sure that they're, they're getting the output they want and have that within the process, not just have to wait till you uh, run it at the end and see the, the, the final result. Okay, now we're ready for questions. Uh-oh. -uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start here with uh, D uh, Dan Baumgart from our you know, our Sue. This has helped a lot on the training aspect. Uh, you've got a couple of uh, notes. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to make a mention that I, I think I'm gonna make a module for the January uh, updates that are coming out. It seems like those are pretty robust, and and so maybe a 10 minute module uh, recording uh, I will put together to highlight those changes, kind of talk about them a little bit. The other item is just kind of. Now that we're into the season, and we, you might have had some of the training, you know, weeks ago, a month ago, uh, the training's very modular. So, if you're not quite remembering how Prob Ice Present works or the top-down grids, you know, most of those modules are short enough where you can go in and just get a, a quick spin up off the learning center and retake those modules, or they're, you know, in the in uh, on YouTube as well. So. I would say just just revisit those science training techniques uh, and 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 refresh yourself on those. Um, one of the one of the observation I guess observations I'd like to 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 share with you is 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 when I watch my forecasters or when offices just take on the probability of weather type grids. Um, typically, they'll see weather outcomes that they didn't expect. Uh, and, and not typically, but but at times you'll you'll get weather outcomes that you didn't expect. And when you dig into the science a little bit more, if you built the science in right, um, you'll see that those outcomes are actually uh, pretty valid. So so when you see something drop out, if you built the the science grids right, the top down grids uh, correctly to to emulate the environment that, that you think is going to happen, um, don't be quick to throw out what the outcomes are from, from those probabilities because they may be pretty solid in their science and I, I think they are pretty solid in their science. So um, give those a chance. Uh, I know from this icing event down south I requested some feedback from some of the offices and I think some of the things that we were hearing is that and they, they were pleasantly surprised at how the science worked and how it came out and, and uh, when they reinvestigated some of the sounding information that it really was valid, um, what what the, the technique was giving them. So I think concentrate on the science and the training side of it and in the grids work the science side of it and let the outcome fall where it does. And if there's issues that you see that are drastically different, then possibly um, document those. But just kind of from a standpoint of how this works the best as far as an operational um, methodology, that's, that's kind of what I'd recommend. So that's all I have. Hey, thanks, Dan. Great tab. Too many tabs open. <laughs> all right, I'll, anybody have questions? Ah, 
No, no questions, it looks like. Uh, no questions. Pretty quiet. Well, uh, I, I want to say thank you for, again, everybody attending. Uh, have a hap happy, uh, Merry, you know, happy New Year and Merry Christmas through the, you know, all the holidays here. Uh, <laughs> and uh, see you in another couple of weeks. Uh, and, and anticipate maybe the next webinar happening uh, might be a, a week or two or so into January. Uh, we'll have to you know, fo focus it in here hard on the uh, get the tech order out, make sure everything is good. Uh, the test bed offices can probably expect to see that. Uh, see the tech order probably sometime in the first week of January. Immediately there after the new year, we're gonna we're gonna push hard for that. Uh, if not, it'll be the week after, and then we'll let the test beds experiment, uh, test it out, and then send it out to the rest of the rest of the field um, thereafter. So, uh, and certainly, uh, like say I think Chuck mentioned about if you have any issues with Forecast Builder about the you know noting that you know do that you know check if you have the latest version installed. I mean, that'll only take you a couple minutes uh, to run through. It just checks and ensures everything's up to date. Uh, pretty, pretty easy. So that's the way we try to make the installs. That's all I got. Well, thank you, Andy and Chuck and Jerry and everyone for joining us today. And um, as uh, Andy said, um, have yourself a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and be safe and enjoy your time during the holiday season, and we'll see you next year. Bye-bye.